morning. So good to have each of you here this morning. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes. The idea is that when the shells start to fly, even the doubters start to turn to God. But foxholes can also have the opposite effect. Sometimes when the shells start to fly, those of us who believe in God, we start to doubt. When we're under fire and those hardships and the adversity comes, the questions start racing through our minds. Why, God? Why did you let this happen to me? Where are you? You promised to love me. You promised to protect me. You promised to answer my prayers. And yet, somehow, I'm still here in this mess, in this foxhole. And sometimes as we sit in that foxhole, we get even angry with God. We're not sure what to do with that anger, but sometimes it just comes up. We shout at God. We cry out to God. Maybe we shake our fists at God. God, where are you? Why aren't you doing something? Sometimes when we're in those foxholes, we're just tempted to give up and give in to the despair, the hopelessness. Sometimes we even just break down into tears. We feel like God has deserted us. We've all been in those foxholes. I've been there. I've asked those questions. I've had those doubts. Maybe you're in one of those foxholes today. We're in the middle of our series on prayer. It's an essential discipline that God has called us to practice, and we're trying to get better as a church. So far, we've looked at the way in which we have a need to worship in prayer. We've looked at the need for community in prayer, and this week I want to look at our need for answers in prayer. There's something in us where, God, we need some answers. How do you expect us to live without these answers? And so, again, I just point you to your study guide that you got when you came in. Hopefully some of you still have it from previous weeks. That first page here is for sermon notes. After that, there's a study that you can go through where we try to go into more depth about the subject of prayer. But today, we're going to focus on this need for answers. Now, we're taught, those of us raised in the church, to believe that God answers prayer, and we want to believe that. But sometimes we have our questions, we have our doubts. We get into those spaces and our good Christian friends, they come alongside and they remind us, you know, God answers prayer, just keep praying. Have more faith, pray more. And we hear about miracles, God did amazing things. He's providing for somebody, somebody won the lottery today. (laughs) Why isn't that happening for me? It's not working for me right now. So let's ask that question directly today. Does God truly answer prayer? Let's not run from our questions, run from our doubts, run for our concerns. Let's face them. Let's open our hearts and our minds to God's word and let his spirit address our fears. Does God truly answer prayer? Now, to examine this subject, I want to look at a New Testament book. It's a very practical New Testament book. It's written by this man named James, and most scholars believe that this was the physical brother of Jesus, who later in his life came to see his brother as not just his brother, but as the Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he followed Christ in this way and becomes a leader in the Jerusalem church. And tradition tells us he was probably even martyred for his faith. So he understood foxholes. He understood trials. He understood hardship. So it's not surprising that he opens his letter to the churches on this subject 
of hardships. Look at James chapter 1, starting right away in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. James is now writing to all the people of God, the 12 tribes inclusive of Jew and Gentile that are now scattered throughout the ancient world. And he wants them to hear this message about trials. Now, last week we heard about the tremendous successes of the early church, how they came together, how they prayed for one another, how they were taking care of one another's needs, how the world was standing up and taking notice that there was this new group in town that that somehow had something different. But as this group grew stronger, as it multiplied throughout the various towns and cities in the ancient Roman Empire, it drew opposition. The religious leaders of the day, they began to see this early church as kind of like a cult group, a seditious group that was infiltrating the synagogues and teaching about this new leader named Jesus. The Roman government began to suspect them as another seditious group, a group that wouldn't bow their knee to Caesar, who wouldn't participate in the public worship, who wouldn't agree with the morals of the day. They were somehow this secretive society that was plotting the undoing of the government. And so they received this opposition from both religious leaders and from government leaders. They were quickly becoming a persecuted minority in their society. Does it sound familiar at all? Sadly, we perhaps ought to be thinking about this status because we may be getting there if we're not there already. But James says that we experience trials of many kinds, not just the opposition because of our faith, but also the stuff that comes from just doing life. Life in this broken world with broken bodies and broken relationships, broken finances, they're all part of life, money, family, job. They just press in on us. We Christians, we're not immune from all the trials that everyone else faces every day. We just stack that on top. Paul, you remember, he makes that point in his letter to the Corinthians where he says, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. It's interesting that that word temptation that's translated temptation here in Paul's letters is the same word that is translated trial in James's letter. It's also the same word that we find in the Lord's Prayer when we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. See, in the ancient language of the New Testament, these concepts of trial and test and temptation, they're interconnected, they're linked up. Because, see, adversity, it can either be a trial that strengthens us or a temptation that breaks us. When those adversities hit us, the first thing that ought to trigger in our mind is this is a test, this is a trial, and if I'm not careful, it can make me or it can break me. I need the caution light to go off. See, on the one hand, these testings and trials, they can be things that make us stronger. James says it's about perseverance. You think of the athlete who just adds more miles to their run because they're trying to go further, further, further. The athlete who adds more weights to their lifts so that they can get stronger and stronger. The soldier who goes into more difficult training in, in deserts and in forests and in cold and in heat so that they're stronger and more able to fight the tough battles that are out there. Or even the employee that receives more demanding assignments and shorter deadlines, getting bigger for the bigger clients and the bigger jobs. There's a sense in which this increased stress, this increased pressure, it builds us up, it makes us stronger. But we have to be cautious because, see, this stress can also break us. It can cause us to give up and give in. I can tell you from personal experience as a, a person addicted to food, it's stressful times, difficult times where I want to give up on the diet. 
give up on the workouts and just go back to the way it was. These trials, they can tempt us to give in and give up. So James tells us, don't let the trial become a temptation. Because these trials, they can make us stronger. Now, on one level, we get this in our culture. We get this in our society. We all have phrases in our language that says stuff like, pain is gain. That's a favorite, isn't it? Don't you love it when people say that to you? My favorite is when I was in the Army and we were doing push-ups, and the drill sergeant, they're filled with these. He used to tell us, Pain is just weakness leaving your body. <laughs> Where do they go to school and memorize these things? Like, seriously. I think it's Kelly Clarkson has a song out there, a hit song out there, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> Appreciate that. But James is taking us even deeper. He's not just giving us conventional wisdom, trite phrases, you know, suck it up, this will make you stronger. We get a clue to that because he says, consider it pure joy when you enter these temptations. Which, let's face it, is just pure crazy. That's crazy. How do you rejoice when you hit cancer? or death, or job loss, or divorce. Really? Rejoice? What planet are you living in, James? See, I believe James is telling us we need to think deeply. We need to slow down. We need to consider our pain and our suffering more carefully. Because obviously the pain and the suffering part is not the last word. There's something beyond that. God's story is still being told. God's story in the world, God's story in us. Our suffering, our pain, this foxhole is not where this story ends. There's something beyond this. James says that it produces perseverance in us. Some translations have steadfastness in us. And then he expands on that thought in verse 4. Look at the text. James says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, James is reminding us that this foxhole, it's part of a process. It's a process that's been going on since the beginning of time. God is restoring and remaking the world, and there are some baneful periods in the middle of that, but the end of the game has not changed. The end of the process has not changed. He's seeking to restore and to remake us so that we are this complete, uh, perfect, healed person. And somehow this journey, this brokenness, it's going to somehow contribute to that. God is not going to let that beat us. He's going to work through it. He's going to pour his grace into it because our destiny has not changed. This destiny is sure and certain. We are destined to be pure, whole, completed people. Imagine that. Last week, we saw this destiny described in a different way by the Apostle Paul in his book to the Romans. He says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, that's our destiny, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. Think about that destiny, to think like Jesus, to have the perspective of Jesus, to have that inner fortitude, that righteousness that powers itself, himself through these circumstances. This same Jesus was tested, tempted as we are. He had a power to get through that. This same Jesus who was ridiculed by friends and family, he had the power to go through that. 
This same Jesus who suffered with the people had the power to go through that. He had the power to go through even physical death, and he was proven victorious in resurrection. Do you see that that's the power, that's the victory, that's the wholeness that God wants to give to you? So that these foxholes, these troubles, these trials, they're not the end of our story. God wants to breathe his hope, his victory, his power into our soul. These foxholes, they will not hold us captive. God will lead us out of them if we hold on. We need to get our eyes up above that which breaks us down. James wants us to lift our eyes, see something greater, see something that maybe isn't visible right now. A different destiny is sure and certain for us. Paul puts it this way. Look at this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, that's humorous, light and momentary. They don't feel light and momentary, do they? But by comparison, he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but is what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, here's the thing. When we're going through this pain and we're going through this suffering, naturally our eyes and our minds are focused on the here and now because that just fills and floods our minds. James is saying, look, your answer might not be in the here and now. Your answer may be in the future. It may be coming. And so we need to get our eyes off of what we can see. Now, this is an obvious contradiction. It's a use of language to get us to press beyond. Obviously, our eyes can only see what it can see. But he's saying, go beyond that. See what God has already revealed. See that there is a glory ordained for us. We are more than these bodies that are wasting away. We are more than these relationships that are falling apart. We are more than this broken finance. We are a holder of the glory of God, and someday this destiny is promised to us. He will reveal his glory through us. We will be whole and healed for all eternity. It's an eternal glory. We cannot take this hope away. No one can. It's a destiny that God promised to us. We didn't earn it. It's not wishful thinking. It's not a naive dream. It's a promise that God himself gave to us from the beginning of time. You will be made whole. He will heal in his way and in his time. And that, that hope has to give us strength. This week, I spoke with a woman who received some very, very disturbing news from the doctor. And she was processing this grievous news, and in the process of thinking it through, she said to me, you know, it seems like everyone wants to take my hope away. She's telling me there is no hope. And I was able to share this truth with her. I mean, I have no words. I don't don't have any answers to some of this stuff. But I was able to talk about this. See, you have a hope that no one can take from you. Because it comes from God. It's not just naive thinking. Jesus himself demonstrated this hope by rising again from the dead. See, there is hope that no one can take from us at any time. We fix ourselves to that hope. See, somehow the foxhole, we realize it's not where we're going to end up. God can even raise the dead. So nothing, no obstacle is going to separate us from that love. It's an eternal love. So sometimes our answers lie in the future. But sometimes that seems a long way off, doesn't it? It's not that easy. It's not that simple. The distance between here and there, it's a long one, and sometimes 
Our destiny, we can't even get there. It's just too painful for the here and now. We still can't get our arms around the questions. They keep coming. It's not good enough. God, we need an answer now. We, we need something right now. How in the world could all this bad stuff be part of your plan? We, we, we just don't get it. God, we need an answer. Well, James is prepared with a response, but let me warn you in advance, I, think, I don't think we're going to like it. At least not at first glance. Look what James says. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. So here's the problem, guys. When you run, all you have to do is ask God, and it'll happen. What, are you kidding me? Seriously, James? I've tried that eight million times. I'm still waiting for an answer. Really, James, is it that simple? See, then we start to ask ourselves other questions. Well, maybe it's me. Maybe I don't have enough faith. I just need to believe. I need to deny my doubt. I need to deny. I just need to believe. I just need to wretch up this faith. Or maybe the problem is not enough people are praying, so here's what we got to do. we got to get more people together, because maybe God will take us seriously if we just get more faith and more prayer. The problem's got to be with us here. There's something we're doing wrong, so let's just amp up the faith. Let's amp up the prayer, because God says, if you just do it right, I'll answer. So if it's not answering, it's something we're doing wrong. We get ourselves in that mess. James is not naive. He's not trying to be unclear here. He understands that it's not that simple. He lived a difficult life. He lived a trial-filled life. No, again, I think he's driving us deeper. I think he chooses his words carefully. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask of God. And asking for wisdom is not necessarily the same as asking for answers. Answers and wisdom, sometimes they overlap, but a lot of times they're different. I'm reminded of a passage that we find in the book of Job. It comes near the end after all of Job's comforters try to explain to him why he's suffering. They're explaining why God is doing all this messy stuff in his life. And God is like, you can hear him listening. And at some point he's like, okay, enough, enough, enough. God wants to speak. Look at these words from Job 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. I'd urge you to go back and read that whole chapter. It's one question another where God puts human beings on the stand and said, now you answer the questions for a change. And what you find out is we run out of answers. We don't have them. See, God is poking at a fallacy here, a fallacy in our broken human logic. See, we humans, somehow we thought that we should be able to understand God. We should be able to understand God. God should be able to explain all this to us. God, somehow, you have to make this clear to us. But there's a gap here. There's a gap between God's mind and our mind. As he expresses to the prophet Isaiah, where he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. See, there is a distance here. There are some things we're never going to understand. God's ways can be inscrutable and mysterious. We learned in our first essential truth that God is beyond us. He's above us. We're not going to be able to sort him all out. We're not going to be able to explain everything. He is smarter than us. It's a basic truth. You're not going to win an argument with God. He thinks on a different level. I was watching some guys play chess the other day, and I was marveling about some people that just had the ability to see things, and I'm never, never going to be at that place. My chess game is, okay, that guy can go there. We see one move, two moves, three moves. The geniuses, man, they just see it. 
See, God sees it in a way that we're never going to get. There's a distance there. And James seems to be telling us there's some things about God that you're not going to know. There are some answers you're never going to get because you couldn't handle the truth if you got it. Which begs the question, instead of going after questions, before we ask God to explain himself, maybe we should look at how he has already explained himself. Because the only way we're going to know God and understand God is if God reveals himself to us, which he has done. He has shown himself to us. He has given us his son. He has given us these scriptures. He's given a track record to us of how to, what he thinks about sin and suffering and pain. There's a whole record of where he reveals himself on this subject. So maybe instead of just focusing on getting God to explain himself, we ought to see how he has already explained himself. Instead of chasing down these questions to which there is no answer, maybe we can look at the answers he's already given. And let's just admit up front, there are some questions that can't be answered. There are some things you're not going to figure out. Someone talks to me about why do babies die or holocausts happen or innocent people get cancer or shootings happen to innocent students? Why, God, why? See, I don't think there's an answer to that question. No real answer, at least not one that I can answer. And forgive me, but I think sometimes we look just pure foolish, like those comforters of Job where we think we can go into the mind of God and explain why this stuff. Here's why God let this happen. Seriously, you can figure that out. I mean, ultimately, there's only one real reason for this mess, and it's us. Sin. That's the reason. It's not what God wanted. It's not what God desired. He didn't create us for the pain. He takes no pleasure in our pain. He created a garden for us and put it in there. The pain started when we started not listening to him. So it is this human decision to reject God, not just our sin, but all the sin of the people who've come before, the people around, the ongoing decisions. These just continue to mess up the world. If you want a reason for this pain and suffering, that's it. Let's not blame it on God. It's not his fault. We as a human race, we own that blame. We ought to stand up and accept that blame. But here's the thing. God has not given up on us. God has not given up on his promises. He has not given up on his hope. And he has revealed through his story how he has not given up. These trials, these tribulations, they are not the end. We see that over and over again, that God works through them and beyond them, and he brings these people to a place of victory. So instead of looking for answers in the future, maybe we should look for answers in the past in the story of God, and maybe from that story we will gain wisdom for today. Wisdom of how to work through. Wisdom on how to get beyond the foxhole, through all the hardships, through the challenges. God gives us that wisdom. That's the hope we hold on to. See, we will achieve our victory the same way the ancients achieved theirs, by being faithful to the God who never gives up on us, faithful to the God who is always faithful to us. But we need to hold on to that vision. We need to hold on to that truth. There's where our success lies. Look at this passage from James chapter 1 as he continues. He says, but when you ask, when you ask God for this wisdom, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Ouch, I don't like this. I think it's talking about me. I'm taking it personally. I've been there. 
I've doubted. I've asked questions. And he's saying, do you understand that when you're in that place and you don't get beyond those questions, you're not going to win there? See, I don't think, again, I don't think James is trying to be discouraged here. He's not trying to say, don't ask your questions. He listens without fault, God. But he's saying, listen, if you stay stuck in this place, if you stay stuck in these questions that have no answers, do you understand how you're going to go down with the ship? How the storms are of life, they're going to overtake you? Like Peter, you're going to get caught in the waves and you go down? See, our victory, the path to our victory involves us holding on to this God with everything we've got. Something happens when we commit ourselves to that. A healing starts to take place. A strength starts to come. God starts to give us a different quality of strength. We don't crumble under the hardships of this life. we find that God does, in fact, make us stronger. We are more and more filled with the power of God in our lives. Christ's power can invade us. We can see beyond. We can start to see why Paul can sit in a prison and say, rejoice. We start to see why James can look beyond the trials and say, rejoice, because there's an inner quality of strength that comes from leaning on this God so that we're not unstable, we're not kicked around, we're not shuffled all over the place. There is wisdom in this work. I just finished walking through Grief Share. It's an amazing program we have here, 13 weeks of wonderful, wonderful God-honoring work. There are collection people there asking questions to which there are no answers. How do you answer questions about someone you love and care about just suddenly ripped out of your life? There are no answers there. You know what I saw? I saw a group of people who came together every week and they said, you know what, we don't have all the answers, but we're going to stay faithful. We're going we're to search the scriptures. We're going to find wisdom. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to hold on to this hope. And week after week, as these people gathered, I'm telling you, church, I wish you could just see a window into that. You ought to be so blessed by the presence of that ministry. That is working out concretely this truth. Sometimes all the answers aren't there, but there are answers in this record of Scripture. There are answers in God's Spirit working through one another. There is comfort and peace and joy that comes even in the midst of these unanswered questions. something about holding on to that God who will not let go of us. And there's a victory promised. Look at this verse. James finally summarizes this point in verse 12. He says, blessed, happy, content, joyous is the one who perseveres and is steadfast under trial. Why? Because having stood the test, that person will receive guaranteed the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There is a promise. There is a crown. There is victory. It is the resurrection victory of Jesus Christ. That is ours. But we need to survive the test. We can't fall to the temptation. We survive that test when we realize God will never, never, never let us go. And here's the thing. Those trials and them temptations, we learn in them that we're dependent on this one God. We won't survive. Sometimes when we have everything we want, we don't think we need God because we got it everything. But these trials, man, they teach us that we need God every single day. They teach us to be content with what we have while we're crying about what we don't have. And they teach us this contentment with God that he is all we need. So we began today with this question. Does God truly answer prayer? And obviously the answer is yes, he does, but he does it in his way and in his time. Some of those answers, they will come in the future. Some of those answers, they've already been given in the past. We just haven't applied them to ourselves. But right now, sometimes he will give us power. And come back next week, we're going to talk about the power that we need today. 
how we get the power to continue. That's next week's topic. But today, I just want to remind us that he gives us this wisdom and this hope for today. Foxholes are not the last word. God gives us answers outside that foxhole. We just need to hang on to this God that hangs on to us, to not give up, to not give in. We may not know all the answers, but we know the one who is the answer, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's hold on to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this reality. Yes, we don't have all the answers. We want more answers. We want to know more. We want you to answer the question why, but all the why, while you are telling us that you've solved the problems, you've answered the questions, you are restoring the world, and you are restoring us. We need to trust our Father who knows more, who is at work. We need to trust the Son who rose again from the dead, who did not fall down to temptation, to even death, but you rose him again to show us this victory. We need to trust the power of God's Spirit within us, that power that gives us this light, this illumination, this ability to see what we cannot see. In you, Father, we are safe, and we are certain. You are our answer. We ask all this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord.